We're so excited to bring you this talk with John Dalem. John does not have Parkinson's disease. John was referred to us by a friend in the Parkinson's disease community. John's a mountain climber. He's also the, he's the oldest person to complete the, the Explorer, Explorer's Grand Slam. The Explorer's Grand Slam is when someone climbs the highest peaks on all seven continents and goes to both poles. He's one of nine people to accomplish this and the oldest person. John climbed the seven peaks with his son. John has so many inspirational messages about overcoming challenges and obstacles to share with us. So we hope you enjoy today's interview. John, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Wonderful to be here. Excited. We're Excited. so glad to have you. Thank you. Carl, do you want to kick it off? Or you... Well, um, well uh, any more dyskinesia? We had this calm down before we yes, turned yes, the recording yes, yes, yes. off. <laughs> That's what happens this sometimes. Is just, this is excitement. Um, <laughs> Our mutual friend, Tom Shepard, who um, is phenomenal. Um, advocate in the Parkinson's disease community and Tom is actually who introduced us to John. Uh, we did not know of John before. Um, uh, he, Tom introduced uh, John to Carl and um, remember, remember Tom through yeah, Parkinson's.net. Yes, yeah, mm -hmm. a fellow writer at Parkinson's disease.net. So um, John, I have to say, you know, after, when, when you sent the, your information to us, I felt like we should have known you already <laughs> with all your accomplishments in climbing and the Explorers Grand, Z Grand, Grand Slam. Slam. I mean, I, you know, you're, you're kind of a quiet, um, uh, I would say Still your star. star. <laughs> I was going to say a quiet motivator, you know, there's well, always you. people who are doing wonderful things and they're just so modest about yeah. it and they're not they don't flaunt it and um I mean, uh, so, so your accomplishments are, are amazing and uh, um, well i appreciate that just to mention tom shepherd a wonderful uh, human being and uh was very kind to ask me down to talk to his boxing group and i went down and enjoyed that and sweated a little bit and uh, got into that whole thing and then uh, had the opportunity uh, to go out with one of his uh, PD groups in, on a uh, walk the other day and talk mm -hmm. a little bit about my, you know, experiences, but mostly just talking about how to use trekking poles. Mm -hmm. And uh, for people uh, that I often talk to uh, through the whole spectrum that don't want to use trekking poles because it's not manly or it looks silly or something like that. And I got through that real quick. I told <laughs> them they were all they were a lifesaver to me. And uh, they're a wonderful thing to have and never to feel embarrassment. I don't care where you are, as long as you're moving and attempting to do that. Walking poles are uh, just to help, like a good pair of shoes. And uh, so we had a real nice time with Tom. And he's written some very, what I like, short, concise um, little articles that I have shared with uh, other uh, people that I know that have Parkinson's and uh, been a tremendous help. And some have read your book, needless to say, too. So uh, sort of got into it that way. And uh, uh, as I say, uh, kudos to Tom. Kudos to Tom. And you. Hey, Tom. Both Thanks. of you. Uh, well, thank you. Both of you. Well, um, John, can you give us a little bit of a background about how you got into climbing and, yeah. and how you got into it at a later stage in your life? Yeah, um, I was a Boy Scout, Eagle Scout, which I am still <laughs> proud of today. And so I did a lot of backpacking, but I never really did any sort of climbing as per se. I climbed uh, Mount Whitney several times. And what happened was my son said, Dad, I want to go up Mount Whitney. Uh, let's go. And of course, my son was, need to say, younger than when I was at the Boy Scouts. So we climbed Mount Whitney and he said that was really good. And then I took a few of my students up to Mount Whitney and then we climbed Mount Rainier after that. My son, Hay said, let's go climb Mount Rainier. And on Mount Rainier, which is a pretty difficult mountain, glaciers and all of that, uh, we met 
our guide who would be our guide for all our future climbs. And he's a businessman, but he was a great uh, guide. And he says, well, you did a great job on the Rainier. Why don't you try Kilimanjaro? And we hadn't even thought about Kilimanjaro. We didn't know anything about Kilimanjaro, 19,000 feet, et cetera. So we tried Kilimanjaro. After Kilimanjaro, he says, why don't you try Denali? And we were off to the races. And uh, needless to say, through his tutelage and uh, his excellent leadership, uh, he got us into climbing. And I started this at age 50 and didn't start really seriously, the serious climb until about age 60. And the key part was, that it's a, it's a continuation of life. I've always said, uh, I, I teach a little class in retirement and people always say, you know, they're worrying about retirement. And I said, well, the key to retirement is a little saying I always have, retire every day while you're working, <laughs> which simply just means while you're working, think about your retirement. And so I was thinking about that with what I was going to do afterwards is just a continuation. And uh, the key really whole factor was my ability to climb with my son. And the, the two of us uh, work very well together. And as we go on, uh, the father-son becomes son-father relationship. In our last serious climb, uh, he basically uh, was the leader and uh, I sort of followed him, which was, which was fun. And uh, cl climbing's not about summits, it really isn't. As soon as you get into climbing, it's all about the harmony of being outdoors, attempting to do something, even if you don't get up the mountain, a realization that that mountain's gonna be there long after I'm around. And uh, it, who cares if you get to the top? Uh, those people who say, I conquer a mountain, you never conquer a mountain. You, you just are part of that. And so I think that's real important. Well, that, that, that makes me, what makes me ask, um, the conversations you had about uh, we're talking about we're on the we're on the dinner table. Well, uh, we're, we're going to Kilimanjaro. What do you think? Well, uh, uh, how, 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 how did that come about? I mean, well, it was sort of interesting because my wife, and you got to understand, my wife has allowed her husband and her son to go on some very difficult trips. Yes, and she said that okay, Kilimanjaro. Uh, how are you going to prepare? What are you going to do? And I think she's always trusted the preparation that we had to go through. And so she was always very supportive of that. And then later on, I said, hey, why don't you try to do a few of these things that we did? And uh, I'll tell you, um, I won't say she doesn't like the outdoor life. She loves the outdoor life. But some of the hikes that we went on were pretty, pretty tough and pretty and some of the climbs. And so she uh, uh, went with me to Bhutan, where we took a 150 mile walk. She went to Everest Base Camp after I'd climbed Everest, all the way up to 17,000 feet. So she was a real trooper. And uh, but just her support and her realization that we had trained, we had done everything we could, and that she felt comfortable. I know it wasn't easy when we said goodbye to climb Everest. It was 66 days that both of us go on before we see her again. That's a long time. And, but she was very proactive very excited about us going because uh, we were living our dream that's a long time yeah very long very <laughs> long very long so climbing as you know like it might say it was i climbed it but really my son and then of course my wife was right there the whole time and we had excellent guides uh both of us uh are teachers and we realize that when we go to a class we need to listen to the teacher we need to do what they're telling us to do. And that was our attitude with all of our guides. Uh, we, we were putting our lives in their hands and we were gonna listen. Now you'd be amazed how some people wanna tell the guides what to do and they're gonna do it their way. And we're going, nope, it was the old, my old army, yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> well, John, um, in our, we did meet previously, you know, we talked on the phone before we did the Zoom interview. And that was one thing that really struck me in our, our previous conversation was you were, you said you developed lifelong uh, friendships and relationships with your guides because, you know, you're, you're, you do put your life in your hand, in their hands, but you also, they put, they put their lives in your hands to some extent. And um, I was really touched by that when you mentioned that in our previous talk. Yeah. It's, you know, the word guide or someone to help me up the mountain, it's, it's really a misnomer. Uh, they're human beings, just like you are. They have full eyes. Uh, my Sherpa, and I hate to use that word, my Sherpa, the Sherpa that guided me to the top of Mount Everest is a man that lost four family members in climbing, 
uh, to understand how they live, you know, you'd have to walk a mile to get water, uh, no, no flowing water. The animals lived underneath them. Uh, and, and, you, and you just shake your head. You say, well, those poor people, they're not poor. They're rich in their beliefs. And, and you realize it's an education. And he was a wonderful human being and he was working extremely hard. He climbed Mount Everest 16 times. Wow. He worked extremely hard, realizing in Nepal, the average income is about $400 a year. So he was working extremely hard, doing fairly well as a Sherpa, was able to send his two, school, two girls, excuse me, to school in Kathmandu because he didn't want them to go through what he went through and wanted to be sure that they were going to be able to go to college, et cetera. None of the things that he could have done when he was young. He had to walk four miles every day just to get to school. Wow. Four miles to, four miles back every day. So he was an inspiration to me. He was a mentor to me. Uh, he taught me so much. I can happily say that I'm still in good contact. One of the proudest things ever happened is he named his son's middle name, John, which is my first name. Uh -huh. That I have a great deal of pride. I have seen him. He has now moved to the United States. He's doing well. His daughters are going to college. So that, that's a blessing besides just putting on your boots and going up the mountain. Well, but I, I, I do recall that people in Nepal are some of the happiest people on the planet because they have this this um life love, love of life love of life appreciation for what they do have and um i you know even under those conditions i'm 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 always struck when i hear about that because i think their mindset and their beliefs are really powerful uh, holistic powerful. in how they approach living very much so and I, and I wish everyone could travel a great deal around the world and number one realize how lucky we are but because we are so lucky, we need to do something for that. So here are people toying in the fields, digging out potatoes and things of that nature. They're happy. There's no reason we can't be happy, too, in all the wealth and excess that we often have. And that, that's something to be remembered, very much so. Well, and I think a lot of that has to do with adversity. You know, mm -hmm. we, we were talking in that in our, our initial Correct. conversation is coping with adversity and and. I think you eloquently talked about, uh, you know, visiting, visiting and, and getting to know people with Parkinson's and that type of adversity, you know, and some of the challenges that you had in, in doing these um, in your life in general. And uh, I think a lot of folks don't realize the the challenges that chronic conditions can put in, you know, people to even to do the smallest task uh, on an everyday basis. Very much. And I learned a lot. Out of, I, I hate to use the word thought, but I was in Vietnam and, and went through that whole process, too. And what it basically comes down to is I think all human beings uh, need to realize that they do have a control over one thing, and that's how they feel. And if they feel bad, they're probably going to be bad. If they feel good, they're probably going to be good, regardless of what is happening to them, regardless of their physical situation. Uh, Attempting to feel good and attempting to do something about that and attempting to be positive, which is not easy, but that's a positive outlook on life. Uh, uh, my son and I talk a lot about Mount Everest, and it, it's strange. Recently, most of our talks have been, and I hate to use the word, but to the elderly, those people in, say, their 60s and 70s, and they're certainly not going to climb Mount Everest. Uh, many are there in wheelchairs. Many are non-ambulatory. And we just simply say, as best you can, get outside today and get the mail. That's your walk. And then maybe push a little bit further and go around the block and push a little bit further and, and do the best you can. Uh, and I think that's really important, particularly people that aren't as fortunate, less fortunate. I've dealt with a lot of Vietnam vets, both physically and those psychologically, as we often said, they came home, but they never came back from Vietnam and work with them and just try to get that positive, upbeat base. It's not always easy, but you do have a choice. You do have a choice mentally as best as you can handle that and, and try to feel as best as you can. And that's why I'm, I'm so impressed with the people that I've met in the Parkinson's disease groupings where they, I, I went down boxing and here was an individual sitting in a chair, just sort of slowly hitting a bag, big smile on her face. Here was another on the speed bag. Here was one that I would, if I'd have gotten a fight, would have probably knocked me out. All different levels, but all attempting to do what they can do. Uh, when I coached 
And I'll talk about, a, I used a lot of phrases that really meant a lot to me. And uh, the sport of wrestling requires a tremendous amount of work. And, and one of my favorite sayings is, no one controls time. It's going to be tomorrow, regardless if you don't do anything today. You know you're supposed to go to your PD meeting. You know you're supposed to hit the bag. You know you're supposed to walk. It's going to be tomorrow, whether you do or not. If it's tomorrow and you did what you were supposed to do yesterday, you're ahead of the game. I know Warren Buffett, who we all know, lived his and had lives his life today as he drives through McDonald's each morning and gets his Big Mac. That you know it's called compounding, and I really believe that. And you have a choice. In wrestling, you could sit in the room and you could not work hard, and you'd get through practice. But tomorrow you're behind. So as much as you can do today in small increments, whatever it is to get better. And, and that was true in our training for the mountains. Uh, we found that not only did you have to train yourself physically, you had to train yourself mentally. And so we would do climbs that would normally be very exhausting up a mountain. We would do it twice. And you would get back down to your car and you'd want to get into that car and drive home and have a nice malt or something. But we turned around and went back up. And we were tired, but just getting through that mental barrier. Yeah. Easy to say, easy to say, but very difficult. But if you believe in that, uh, it helps. Uh, um, I have to ask you, uh, uh, you, 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 were, you were commander in Vietnam, uh, and, and you stood a Bronze Star. Um, yes, um, which is. Uh, and, um, uh, which was more difficult? Vietnam or, or uh, both, both incredible challenges and different challenges, both, both life, life threatening. Uh, Everest, Everest or Vietnam? I mean, to... that's that's really a good question because people say, you know, is war. I, I think uh, war is always more scary because you don't always have controllable elements. And if you're not doing well in a climb, you just go, you know, not today. I'm going to go down. Uh, as we always say, in war, you never know, you know, when your time comes, as they say. So that can be difficult and you sort of have to control it. And with my men, uh, at times that became difficult and you'd have to control those fears. And again, it got back to training. It got back to you knew what you were doing and you attempted to go with that. And there are, all people are different. You know, that, oh, there's not a bullet out there with my name on it. You know, I had guys like that, that I had guys that I couldn't get into battle they just refuse to go so um everybody's a little bit different about that but i think again it's taking on those challenges which which are difficult and can be life-changing and uh, climbing mountains uh, everyone always tell me how did you feel when you got to the top of mount everest all i could think about is getting down uh, there wasn't any celebration and i cried and, and, and did all that but i wanted to get down and i was really worried about that so until you've completed that whole journey uh you know, it, it's never really over. And I think the journey of the PD uh, is the same thing. Uh, it, it's a journey. It, it's a continuous journey that you go through. And uh, it, I, I don't the, the word enjoyment probably isn't good, but the challenge of going through that journey has a lot to do with making you feel good because you are doing things just as you too are doing this right now. And the book that you wrote and the connections that you've made in making a difference in the lives of human beings there's nothing better it's very kind of you to say thank is, you john yeah i know this is after something so serious so i have to ask you what, what was the last thing you ate what was the first thing you ate after after coming off everest that's really good uh, <laughs> people, first of all they always ask me what did i eat and interestingly at altitude you don't eat much you can barely eat. Uh, if you were to put a cookie in your mouth at very high altitude, it'd take a half an hour for just the saliva to break it down. Wow. So you're eating very little. Uh, what happens at someone my age is you train very hard, you get very good physical shape, you're all excited. And as you climb mountains, you can breathe better, but your shape is going down. So that there's mm -hmm. sort of an equal, so that you hope you still have enough shape left in you. You can breathe, but you hope you have enough shape in you. So of course, when we got back, I love chocolate. So after we had recuperated, made our way off the mountain and back to Kathmandu and everything, we found a, <laughs> a place where they had chocolate uh, sundaes. 
mm. with ice cream. And believe me, let us say that we went through a few of those. <laughs> <laughs> That was the few. That was, but yeah, it was very interesting. The food is very good at base camp. So you're not really, God, I wish I was at Hamburg. They feed you very well. When you get up high, you just don't want to eat. They, no big deal. So you're eating candy. And yeah, you have to be careful because I always walked with uh, three musketeer bars and stuff, but they always froze. Uh -huh. So still today, I will cut up my three musketeer bars and eat them, even though they're soft. It just sort of remind me that I had to cut them up on Mount Everest and they were like brick. And you'd put them in your <laughs> mouth and wait till they dissolve. Yeah, I don't think there's very many dentists on Everest in case you no, chip it. No, not a lot of. Them. <laughs> yeah, you have some, and some people, believe it or not, some people do have that problem because uh -huh. they eat food and they'll break a crown and then they have uh -huh. to end their their expedition all because they broke a crown off. So uh -huh. it's tough. Uh, that's very uh, I, that's very painful. I, I I had a crown fail and. Uh, uh, I was, it was, I was, yeah, and you weren't even on Everest, you no, were just yeah. in a rural area. Uh, I was, I was in rural <laughs> Not pleasant <area>. anywhere. <laughs> you uh, must have to go to Kathmandu to get a dentist. After, yeah, you know, yeah. You've done all the months of training because it's it, how, and I, I can't seem to remember exactly what I read in your bio, but how many months did you prepare just to do the Everest? Well, we, we progress, you know, from when we started to climb to when we finished the, uh, what they call the Explorer's Grand Slam. It's 10 years. Uh, it was about nine years before we climbed Mount Everest. So it's a progressive situation. But, you know, my son was working. I was still working for part of the climb. So it was up and down. And we tried to stay in, in what we considered to be good shape where we walk every day or run every day. And then when you start to prepare yourself for your mountains, you really went into preparations that were good for climbing mountains. And the best preparation for climbing mountains is to climb mountains. Climb mountains. So, <laughs> We would in Southern California, not a lot of, you know, 20,000 peaks, foot peaks. So we tried to climb mountains, at, you know, 10,000 feet several times. It's all about going up, you know, 1,000 or 2,000 feet when you train. So that's how we train. Well, uh, uh, the basic question, uh, if, if you've never climbed before, how, um, how, do you, how, do you, how do you just start climbing? How do you learn to climb without, without, without really knowing how to climb? Uh, that, that's... Uh, I, 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 I mean, if, if, oh, you mean like going from hiking? Yeah, to climbing? hiking, hiking to climbing is, 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 is a big step. As you progress in the mountains, you first do your hiking and then you get into what they call glacier climbing. And you need to go to schools. You need to take, you know, a couple of days. We went to a, a week seminar on how to use ropes, how to use crampons, how to use ice, ice axe. Believe it or not, there are, there are people that go to Everest that have the money that have none of those skills. And that's one of the complaints on the mountain today because there are people up there that shouldn't be climbing and they cause lines and stuff like that. But basic skills, and I, I, I can't climb El Capitan or anything in Yosemite or any of that type of thing. There's all sorts of different types of climbing, but you get what they basically call glacier training. And you're prepared as long as you get in shape and things of those nature and with a good attitude to just about climb anywhere but not up some face of some giant cliff. That's, I, I don't do that. No. Uh, 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 and, and you did, you did seven, of the, seven, the seven summits uh, on seven different continents and they were all, all with your son. Did, yes. uh, how, um, what was the conversation like when you, when you, when you and Ryan had the conversation about doing the, about doing the summits? What, 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 well, he was, he was very enthusiastic. His problem was he was, it was working and by the time Everest came up, I had I was retired, so he had to get sixty days off of school. And he's wow. an administrator, so in a private school, so he was able to do that. Unfortunately, he still continued back to work after we finished the uh, seven summits, and I continued on to the North and South Pole, which I'm sure he'll do someday. But it was just opportunities came up at that time, which I could do and he couldn't do. But and, and that sort of made me sad. I, I don't really like going out on any climbs unless it's with him. And I've done some other climbs, too, without him. But it, it, it's just so great. We know each other and we be in the same tent or we'll be in tents next to each other. And we joke a lot, you know, and make fun of each other and stuff like that. So, Well, I, I'm being, being, being one of the three, three boys and, and being the youngest, uh, uh, and, uh, and being being in such close contact, con, con, uh, 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 being so close to your father for so long, were, were there were there any any arguments? No, we we never really argued. Uh, he probably didn't have time. I mean, you know, we each have different personalities. Uh, yeah. I'm very much. Uh, I have my doctorate in psychology, and uh, both my wife and I are personality profilers. And my wife is the complete opposite. <laughs> 
complete opposite of it. You know how you roll your toothpaste and I'm very, roll it very nicely. She just squeezes it. So there's a personality. <laughs> I but, love you too. <laughs> but when it gets to the end, she'll just throw, you know, I'll just throw it away. She cuts it open and uses it, you know, the whole thing. So our personalities are different. My son, I have two sons, my younger son, Ryan, who I climb with, personality is like his mom. So our personalities are somewhat, you know, different and we laugh about that. But, but because we know personality profiling, we realize nobody has a perfect personality. All personalities are perfect. There, there's nothing wrong. They're just different. But it, it really helped to know about personalities to, to get along with people and to understand people. Helped me tremendously being a principal, realizing that not everybody was like me which my personality tends to think you ought to be like me, you know, and that's not a good thing when you're dealing with people at all. Well, I, I just want to take a brief um, break here, John, and tell everyone they may hear some sounds in the background. And um, John just told us before we got on the call that they're actually, it's the Huntington Air Show, Huntington right. Beach Air Show. Correct. So that's probably the Thunderbirds the heading right, right over John's house. <laughs> And, and I, I apologize about that. Everything no, shut, it but it's just one of those things. I just yeah. wanted to tell everybody they're like, we hear something. <laughs> I'm waiting for the jet to come through my room here. That's I can't I can't cut that out in post production. <laughs> no, no. No, I'm sorry about that. Yeah. Oh, don't worry about it. You know that's it's, it's adversity. I mean, it's not hindering the conversation. I just it's, wanted it's, it's, to. It's just an element. It's just an element. Speak louder. I will speak louder. <laughs> Well, I want to ask about your, your, your football your football days. Uh, you, you played football um, in college. Uh, did, did you did you ever? Uh, and I know, I know some of your your, your, your your college mates played 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 pro ball, and uh, and, and did, did quite well. Did, did you did you consider, ever consider going pro? No, 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 no. I I was <laughs> I played uh, freshman football at the University of Oregon. I was a walk on. Everybody wow. just about was a scholarship player. Uh, I got to play quite a bit, not because of my prowess, but because a lot of people got hurt. <laughs> and uh, at the uh, my claim to fame was my freshman coach was John Robinson. And John Robinson, uh, you know, went on to USC and the Rams and whatnot and got wow. to know him well. But no, basically, the my, end of my career was at the end of my freshman year. I had to make a decision of whether to continue to really study and, and go that path, become a teacher. And to be honest with you, I, I had reached my maximum potential in football. If, if I'd have gone any further, I would have <laughs> pancaked somewhere. You know, <laughs> I would be part of somebody's uniform or something. But I, but I loved it very much. And I got active in intramurals and uh, taught, taught me a great deal of being in football. And then that's partially why I got into coaching, uh, because I did play football in high school and then a little bit in college that I really wanted to coach and uh, again, make an impact on, on young men's lives, along with being an educator and whatnot. Teacher, coach are the same word. And uh, that's basically why I did it. So John, did you know, before you started um, at the University of Oregon, did you know that you wanted to get into teaching or? Not completely. I loved history, uh, but what do you do when you're a history major? You, you can't go be a history or you can't go be an English <laughs> say so what are the paths and, and I didn't see myself say intellectually going on to be a professor or anything like that um, but um, I started working with kids sort of in college and then of course my student teaching in college and uh, always loved kids and uh, found out that that was uh, when I got out that was my true vocation it was rather interesting my father was a very successful businessman and he called me in and he said John you realize that you're not going to make much money. Are you sure you want to do that? And I said, I want to be a teacher. And thank God to my dad, he said, the most important thing in your life is you be happy. And uh, whatever you're doing, I don't care what it is, do it well, work hard at whatever your profession is. And that's the way I approach teaching. And, uh, uh, you know, as, as we jokingly sort of say, you, you, you can really not jokingly make a difference in the lives of kids. Or if you're a poor teacher and as administrator, I had to deal with poor teachers, you can make a very negative impact upon kids. And, and he will talk to any, and both of you, you can name your favorite teacher. And I always tell everybody, whoever your favorite teacher was, write them a note. I don't care if you're 50 or 60, find out and hopefully they're still alive, find out where they are and write them a note 
and tell them how much they meant to you. I did that. Is, yeah, no greater gift than you can give to any teacher. And unfortunately, some teachers shouldn't be teaching kids. I interviewed people that said, I don't love kids. And I said, well, it's been nice talking with you. <laughs> I'm not going to hire you because that's the first thing, because you have to have that. And it's a skill. And I hate too many teachers I hear, I can't wait to retire when I, 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 you know, that was always hard on me as I tried to talk to teachers to improve their skill. And you have to improve your skills because the kids are changing, uh, society's changing. And, you know, here we are in Zoom, all the kids in California, all over the United States, this was their school. Think about being a teacher and looking into a screen like this with not even faces, just names in teaching. Uh, God bless our teachers that were able to yeah. do that during the COVID time. You make, you're, making me, you're making me think of Mr. Holland's opus. Mm -hmm. Correct. But you're also making me think of our uh, nephew-in-law who's a teacher and um, not only is he a teacher, he's a coach. He a and, you know, honestly, I wondered how he always did that, but I, I got a sense from hearing you. He loves the kids. He loves the kids and he loves being uh, the, the, like you said, coach and teacher are one and the same. And I think that, that's a beautiful passion to have, to want to touch touch children's lives that way. It's, it's incredible. And coaching is a little bit of an extension because in the classroom, it's a day-to-day -day basis. You've got five periods, the bell rings, the next class comes in. You don't have a lot of opportunities to sit down and talk with the students on a personal basis. When you're coaching, and you remember they're the number one stakeholders you have, the kids, not your principal or anybody else, that they become an integral part of your life. And most of them have great parents, but some don't. And uh, there's, there's a reference I often say that all of us have one father, but many of us have numerous dads and those people who play an impact in your life. And that's where you get that when you coach. You, you get that personal relationship that sometimes you don't get when you're teaching. Were you, were you able to coach when you, when you were a principal? Uh, 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 well, <laughs> my wife would laugh about that. No, I, I did not have a coaching assignment, but I occasionally found my way to drift onto the football field <laughs> the wrestling room, and the coaches would, of course, shoo me off and what <laughs> So, no, uh, and I have remained very active in a organization called CIF, California Scholastic Federation. We have 585 high schools wow. in our one section, and I help with the organization of sports, both boys and girls, and this is an exciting time because this is the anniversary of Title IX, and helping girls, you know, allowing them to be in sports, which they weren't before. So I spent a lot of time with that. I, I do a lot of their history, and it's just fun. So I'm still active with kids, even though I'm retired. Would, 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 um, would it be too uh, um, politically... Um... Uh, um, uh, dangerous to ask you a question, a question about the NCAA uh, and your opinion on, on student, student student athletes. Fire away, no problem. <laughs> uh, uh, do you, do you, are you are you in agreement with with? Um, and I, 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 I'll say I'll say my opinion. The the agreement about uh, the student athletes getting a percentage of their their pay. Uh, yeah. Their pay. Yeah. Down deep, it, 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 it somewhat bothers me because I come from a different time when you got a scholarship. Oh, my goodness, you'd be thankful for a scholarship that's going to pay. But, but things are changing, and some of the rules are obtruse, and, and, and really the NCA has not done a, a good job of keeping abreast, I think, of, of what's happening today. It's a difficult situation. What's going to be very interesting is to see if the NCA can even exist still. And the other thing is that the, the, the haves will get more of a have and the have nots will be at the other end of the spectrum. That I worry about the most. Uh, what's been going on in college sports with uh, uh, people going out and, and contacting, you know, pro people has been going on for years, goes on in high school. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I'm not real happy with it, but I sort of understand it. And that's the student athletes who are, in fact, you know, providing a product of which the universities take advantage of. Uh, I think the NCA needs to look at, uh, should we pay a football coach $6 million, uh, which is maybe 20, 30 times the highest paid profession, uh, professor on their campus, uh, are we really doing the right things? And when I say the haves will continue to do that, the have nots, which can't keep up, it's sort of sad. But today I deal with students in high school uh, on some of these hearings that I do for my group that only way they think they're going to get to college is through an athletic scholarship. 
or the only way their parents think they're going to get to school to college is transfer from school a to school b because school b has a better football program yeah. and i'm very much against that and we have rules for that and we try to convince parents that there are other things in lives sports should be a lifelong event and uh ncaa sports are mostly a shortened event football you don't play football your whole life you don't wrestle your whole life maybe you can play golf or tennis and I think we always ought to remember that. It's a tough time and we'll see how it fares out. I'm sure the government will get active soon. Well, and I'm always concerned about the health consequences of, of sports in general. Uh, we just had a friend pass away from um, I, dementia and, mm-hmm. and complications of that. And he was a college uh, athlete in football and, you know, the head trauma probably had an impact on his formation of that condition. And that's what I'm always worried about the kids today. We know so much more than we did back in the sixties and seventies about head trauma and how it impacts the body for life. I'm on our sports medicine committee in California. We've been very active in that. And uh, most people have seen pro football games from the stands. I wish parents and everybody could get down on the sideline and see the size of individuals today. And when you're 380 pounds and can run fast and you hit another human being, there are going to be consequences. These are all in all sports. Uh, and we do a lot of safety from pole vaulting to, you know, whatever it is. So we, we have to be very vigilant and, and parents have to be very vigilant and have to be sure that they're getting good instruction. Because when you stick a helmet on a five-year-old, I, I think you've missed the point. Uh, I think you just need to wait. Now, I want to get back to edu- educators. Um, I, I, I think we, I don't understand the discrepancy of, of paying Hollywood entertainers umpteen millions of dollars and, and educators uh, uh, the, 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 um, the sum that they're... Well, some of them are actually close to the poverty line yeah, in some states. It, 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 they don't make it, it, enough. They have to have such, multiple such, such an important job and, and such an underappreciated job. It is. And, uh, but, you know, it's, that's often the way it is. And, and I heard that all the time from teachers. And then finally, I, you know, I would meet with my teachers and I said, you're all intelligent. Just because you're a teacher doesn't mean you have to be poor. There are other ways to make money that are passive, that won't get into your teaching career, try that. So I, I tended to spend more time with my teachers, showing them that there are opportunities if they want to invest their money and whatnot. Uh, most of my close friends that I grew up with, there's one other teacher and he's retired, they're still working, they're doing well, but they still have to work. The one thing that can be said for teachers are that they're on retirements and that's a nice situation, but, but I hardly agree with you. We need to pay our teachers more, we need to support them more, uh, we need to get the unions on board, which I think do a good job of protecting their teachers. But I think the unions also have to remember the number one stakeholders are the kids and what's the best thing for the kids. But I agree with you. I, I would hope that we would start to put money into our teachers. Some of our states are abysmal. And California is not one of the great states, unfortunately, and, and necessarily what they pay versus what it costs to live here. So, you know, it, it's a love, you've got to do it. It's a love, whatever you do, it, it, part of it's a love and you accept that, but there are ways to compensate yourself through investments and whatnot. Particularly if, you know, you've got a college degree, you should have some competency in finding out how to do that. It, well said, definitely. Uh, 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 if my numbers are right, you're, you're, you're 141, of the, of the, you're 141 in the world to complete the Explorers Grand Slam. Uh, uh, if I, if that, that's, I got that. I got that from uh, from your, your interview uh, at the university, of, uh, the, the, your, your university uh, Oregon uh, interview. I, I, I assume that's still accurate. Um, um, but you, you're one you're one of nine. Is is that is that one of nine in the world? That, that, that to, uh, of um, I want to make sure I got the, got the number right. Uh, you're, you're um, one. Where's the, you're, you're, the, you're the oldest person at and just one of the nine Americans to achieve the amazing accomplishment of, 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 of yeah, th- those lists, nobody really keeps those formal lists. You know, some guy <laughs> over here saying, you know, by the way, there are lists for everything. Uh, I like lists. My, <laughs> Jets come by. My son and I were the second oldest Americans, uh, or we were the oldest father son team to ever stand on top of Everest, which someone has surpassed that now. I was the second oldest American. It's funny, you know, 
I could have said I was the, the bald American, the first bald <laughs> American, or I was the first one that has it. So those lists, to be honest, with those who, who climb really don't make much difference. I, I think uh, someone established this Explorer Grand Slam where you had to go to the North Pole and South Pole, but there are all sorts of qualifications because there are people who pull the sleds all the way from the ocean to the pole. There are people who go the last hundred miles. There's all sorts of things. I can say that sadly, there won't be a lot of Grand Slammers be coming because it's very difficult to get to the North Pole today because the denigration, the ice, uh, you just can't do it anymore. When I did it, I did it for just the last hundred miles or so. There are people that pull a sled three, four hundred miles uh, and it, you almost have to swim to the North Pole. South Pole is different. The, the, you'll always be able to get to the South Pole as long as you can get on the continent. So some of these lists are for, and they're always argumentative. They always talk about the seven summits. Some people believe this is the seven summit. That's a, my son and I always joke and we, we hear these things with that's all right. You know, we know that it, it, we gave it a shot. I have some close friends that have tried Evers three or four times and haven't made it. And I have the utmost respect of them. And it doesn't have any difference whether they they made to the top, they made the effort. And that's another key thing. You made the effort. And if you're true to yourself and making that effort, take what you get from it. And I, I don't get the summits, I get the journeys. My son and I have so many experience with taking uh, uh, and thinking about, excuse me, all of the things it took us to get to the top, that, that that's the joy. And, and you, you walk home with that. And uh, you know, how many people win the World Series? Well, if you're runner up, you're still great. And think about that. And you talk to the greatest athletes and they'll say, what was the greatest thing about being a pro, Tom Brady or anything, all the goats as they call them. And the greatest thing I'll always tell you is the locker room being with the guys. You know, the, the other things are great, but it's that day in, day out, you know. Uh, the, the, the seven summits. What 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 what, what was was Beth taking view? You you, you you remember? You know that's really interesting. Everest should have been, but we were in a bad storm. Unfortunately, that was a, a bad day. Probably the one I still enjoy to this day is Denali, Mount McKinley, in Alaska. We were able to see. I we estimated maybe. 300 miles. Wow. It, it was, uh, and of course, is uh, when you get on the real high mountains, when we were in Antarctica, again, another bad day, you can actually see the curvature of the earth. Wow. But Denali was incredible. It, we were what they call a bluebird day. Unbelievable day. We could have had our shorts on, even though it was maybe 40 degrees. Most people are up there when it's minus 20 and they're all you, know, you can't see them and their noses hanging out, you know, and their faces are frosted. We were saying, we looked like we were in Huntington Beach in the summer. Day. <laughs> we were very, very lucky. So that probably to, to Ryan and I, my son, was our favorite view from the top. Yeah. Yeah. Well, John, I have to say, I think you've lived so many lifetimes in, 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 in your span of, of your life and you, you certainly gathered this, this um, incredible depth of uh, passion and compassion all in one and, and knowledge and knowledge and wisdom. And, and I feel like you're a teacher on so many levels, not just um, in the classroom, but do you have any kind of closing thoughts you'd like to impart us with? Yeah, I always, you know, it's very funny when, when I have talks like this or anything, I always, think about, well, what are you going to say before? And it's always much easier when, when you answer questions. And any of you, all of us have sat in lectures that are 40 or 50 minutes long, and you're just going, I got to get out of here. I don't want to listen to this guy anymore. So I always sort of make a goal if, if I could leave, you know, one or two things that people can take. And if they take it, it's fine. If they don't, I'm reading a book and just finished it. And I've read it all my life. And, and this is what it's called. Hopefully you can see it. It's called Make Your Bed. And, and for anybody that has PD, this is the greatest book in the world. It's a short, I'm not, I don't get any money from her thing, besides your book, which should be read. <laughs> this book is a classic. You can see how big it is. For those of you like me that like to go through things quickly or look at pictures or whatever. This book, and I, I don't know if you know about it, but it's the uh, commanding officer of the SEALs. And you may have interviewed him. Or so. He gave oh. the talk at the University of Texas for their uh, graduation speech. And I used the same premises when I was teaching and coaching. Uh, 
Every day you get up, I, I would, when I talk to all my students at the beginning, you know, I'd introduce myself to them, then I'd go around the classroom and I'd have them introduce themselves to me. Hi, my name's Dr. John Dalem. My name's John. And they would say, hi, uh, my name's John. I'd go, well, let's stop. Let's do that again. You have two names. Your name is Juan Espinarza. My name is Joe Smith. And I would shake their hands. I say, super job. And then I'd explain to them why I do that is because eventually they're going to have to come to somebody like me and get a job. And you don't want to put your head down. And so we'd go through that. And so one of my favorite things is every day you get up, make your bed. That's the first thing you can do It's good as best as you can, because <laughs> I know some will just throw it back or kick <laughs> it back or physically may me not be able to do, it, but do the best you can make your bed and you're off to the races for that day. And this book also contains a lot about life isn't fair. Uh, you know, you're going to have to overcome things. People aren't fair to you all the time. How are you going to deal with that? You, you, and you never ring the bell. And with your group, you never ring the bell, you, which is you never give up. And you just keep on keeping, as, as I like to put on all my letters, just keep on keeping. Or as Yogi Bear said, uh, Yogi Bear, Yogi Berra said, when you come to a fork in the road, take, take it. Take it. <laughs> and I, I love things like that. And believe it or not, kids will go out and have bought this book. And it's, it's more than just make your bed. Yeah. But there's a lot to be said for this book. A lot of what I think you talk about in your book, and holistic and spiritual, you know, fulfillment and everything as you go on in life. So that's my little tidbit that I'm leaving with you. John Dalen, you're, 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 you're amazing. I, I, I could talk to you for hours. Uh, 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 days. <laughs> I'd love to meet you in person. Uh, one of these days, if, 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 if you hopefully we can. Hopefully, we can. To, absolutely. It, it's been a sure pleasure talking to you. And an well, inspiration, John. Thank you so well, much. John, well, and you're the inspiration. And I say that seriously. I don't want to pander or anything. I have the utmost respect for what you're doing. Period. And uh, you should lodge yourself in the help, that both of you. And uh, Carl, what, you, what you're doing, both of you, it takes two, as I well know. It does. It's 56 a, years of marriage, uh, I know. Oh, my wow. wife and, I, and, and I'm serious uh, because uh, many people, you know, don't rise above that and, and stay, but you're reaching out, you're paying it forward, as we say, making the difference in life. And you're the ones that be accurately. Thanks for having me on. You know, I just oh. appreciate chatting. And hopefully not too many of you got, uh, you know, jetted out of the world with all our jets or snoozed off but i've enjoyed it i really have. Well, well, I, i'm sorry to make you miss, miss their show because i i i'd love, I'd love to see oh, their no. show. it's all three days so i don't <laughs> think to listen to all three days maybe the first 15 minutes great the rest yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> thank you thanks, john uh, thank you so much